like to welcome Stanley. This will be an overview of the Civil War and kind of the things that drove it. Not so much a listing of all these great battles that you generally get in one of these types of presentations. That, by the way, for anybody who does not realize, that is a, somebody, an artist rendering of, I believe, Pickett's Charge at uh, Gettysburg. Okay, the Civil War was the first war, really modern war, that was fought. In the 1840s and 1850s, we finally got, or there was finally developed a gun that could be loaded reasonably fast and be accurate. It was a rifle, it was called a rifled musket. They took the smoothbore muskets, which could be fired at two to three shots a minute, and added rifling. And for those who are not familiar with rifling, it's a set of spiral grooves inside the barrel of a gun, and you'll see it in any modern gun, that spins the bullet. And when you spin the bullet, you stabilize it. So it doesn't, uh, it follows a straightforward, predictable path. The older muskets, the ball came out of there spinning in every which way. There were statements made that you could stand at 150 yards from a fellow with a smooth war musket and he could fire at you all day and the odds were you wouldn't get a scratch. <laughs> <laughs> so the important thing was that the, they added rifling to a smooth war musket and then they use the mini ball. And it's not because it's a small ball, and it's not a ball. <laughs> but it was developed by a French captain named Minet. As a result, it got the name mini ball. The gun itself was single shot, muzzle loading, and a really good man could fire it at three rounds a minute. Uh, an average got about two. It came equipped with a bayonet, and it cost about fourteen to twenty dollars, depending on where they, which manufacturer they bought it from. To give you a reference, a monthly soldier's pay was thirteen dollars, so it was a bit more than a monthly soldier's pay. Now, it fired a what it would today be called a monstrous bullet. 0.5 inch diameter, it's called 58 caliber, 500 grain, which is inch and a quarter, ounce and a quarter, and at muzzle velocity of 950 se foot per second. It, the, uh, an experienced uh, marksman could easily hit a target in the 200, 300 yard range, and there were ones that could hit targets at 500 yards. It was the bullets that missed whoever they were aimed at kept on going and they had enough velocity and momentum so they could kill at a thousand yards, which is a half a mile, which is one of the things that made those Civil War battlefields extremely deadly. Now when the war started, both the Confederacy and the Union massed large numbers of men. And very simply, there were not large numbers of weapons in the country. They were using everything that could fire. There were, there were many regiments originally that were armed with flintlocks. Anything they could get, some, some of them used shotguns. Anything they could find. And both the Union and Confederacy bought, uh, sent agents to Europe to buy guns, mainly in England. They bought on the order, I'm told in the war, about 750,000 Enfield rifles. Uh, the, they didn't get into here until late 1861, so the first battles in the war were fought with uh, basically smooth war weapons because there were very few rifled weapons that were produced before that time. Now, <coughs> The South was always in a bind in that they had practically no manufacturing capability. 
They imported what they could early and after that. To be perfectly honest, they picked them up off the battlefield. The North had manufacturing capability and had two uh, armories, one in Harper's Ferry and one in Springfield. The Springfield one took an, a gun they had designed in 1855 and improved on it and had the model 1861, they called it a rifle musket. They, may, they set up for volume manufacturing in between the Springfield Armory and 14 subcontractors. They produced over a million of them during that war. And there was another variant produced in 1863, which was a bit better. So there were, the numbers of guns used were very, very large. Now the Union favored the Springfield Model 1861, although the two guns were very comparable. The big difference was the Springfield was machine made and had interchangeable parts. If you had two damaged guns, you could make, you literally, the, the, state, the uh, statement lock, stock, and barrel comes from that. Because the lock, the stock, and the barrel were all uh, separate, could be chain, interchanged from gun to gun. The Confederacy, when they could get it, uh, used the British pattern 1853 Enfield, and the Union got quite a few of those in the beginning, so they had quite a few of them. Now, here's a quick picture of what the two guns are, and there really isn't a lot of difference between them when you look at them. They both fired the same diameter round, and in fact, the ammunition was interchangeable, which is very, very good from a logistics point of view. You, when a regiment called for bullets, uh, you'd better send them the right size. Now, whoops, we jumped one. The mini ball. Number one, it wasn't a ball. It was, the top drawing shows you what it was. It was a bullet-shaped projectile, and the base of it had a V in it. So basically it was hollowed out. And the reason was you were going to have to push it down the barrel, so it had to be less than the diameter of the barrel, yet you needed it to engage the rifling when you fired it. So when you fired it, the pressure from the uh, black powder exploding expanded the base of that bullet engaged the rifling and it spun and you know in the length of the barrel it got about one turn and that was enough because it exited at 950 foot per second they typically put a little grease in those lands in there to help seal the uh, exit so that it would uh, go out at as good a velocity as possible. And down below are just a few examples of uh, what it looked like. And I don't know if they've got it out, but downstairs we have a little box of them. Oops. Okay, the mini ball was a, compared to today's bullets, a very large bullet. And it created awful wounds. If you like gore, you can go online and see some pictures people have taken of what the kind of damage they can do to flesh. But the reality is here is kind of an idea. It had lots of momentum. If it struck bone, it shattered it. And the surgeons learned very quickly that if they did not amputate right away, infection would set in and the uh, wounded man was sure to die. So they, amp they, when they got wounds in the limbs, they amputated right away. There were, I was, saw one figure that there were 60,000 amputations during the war, just to give you an idea. And about two-thirds of them survived. Field artillery. This is your other major weapon. Field artillery uh, was also rifled in some cases for long-range target targeting. And these guns were 
easily go three miles and fairly accurately. They added rifling to the uh, about, in most cases, three inch diameter guns, equivalent of the 75 millimeter that the U.S. has used for a standard weapon since World War I. Uh, they also use smooth bore artillery for close in work. It was superior in that. Now we had, and one of the reasons it was superior was it could fire round solid shot. A round solid shot bounces. So if it comes out of the gun, hits the ground, it just goes bouncing along. There's more than one case where a fellow who saw a solid shot put his foot out to stop it and lost his foot. <laughs> it was a thing, the round solid shot went into typically the smooth bores. They had what they called a bolt, which was a solid shot for a rifled uh, field artillery piece. The usual shell we used to, which was an exploding, uh, typically in this case, wrought iron casing with a fuse on it. Canister. Canister is something you're not probably used to, but it was a something that literally looked like a canister. Had about a hundred small iron balls in it, and was fired from typically smooth bore cannons. And when it exited the barrel of the field piece, the case, the canister disintegrated and the gun, the field piece became a, essentially an immense shotgun. It sprayed a hundred bullets out and it was good out to 400 yards. It just mowed down attacking forces. There were cases when the attackers got in, they'd even use double shot. And double shot had meant they were probably within 50 yards, and that did fearful damage. And grape shot is kind of an older version of canister, which didn't have as much. The Union by far had the best artillery, but unfortunately, since the Union had to attack most of the time, it really couldn't use it very well. It could use it when the uh, opposing side was firing to try to soften up for the attack. They could use it for counter battery fire. But the problem basically was if you got much closer than, than a thousand yards to the uh, defenders, you had horses that were pulling that. They made big targets and they got shot. And pretty quickly you had no way to move the gun. And you took, if you uh, lost the battle, the gun was going to the enemy. So they tended not to use uh, artillery in the attack, which is mostly what the Union had. And the Confederate artillery was two-thirds captured. A large quantity of it came from the Harper's Ferry Arsenal capture uh, just before the Battle of Antietam. And they bought pieces they could get from England and then picked up whatever they could from the Union. The, the Union was the biggest supplier of arms to the Confederacy <laughs> by accident, <laughs> but <laughs> that was the fact. Okay, artillery came in many types, but the, the most, uh, there are three most common ones. The second one down on the list is the 12-pounder Napoleon, which had a 4.6 inch bore and it was a smooth bore and was very effective short gun, short in. The next popular one was the 10 pounder Parrot rifle. Now the reason it's called Parrot is because the fellow who manufactured it was named Parrot. It had nothing to do with any other, anything else. <laughs> It's, it was an unusual gun, I'll show you and explain to you. It, it was a, either 2.9 or 3 inches in diameter. After a while, they, they bored them all out to 3 inches because of the ammunition con confusion between the two sizes. Uh, 
Three inch ordnance rifle was the other one that was used. And it was used quite heavily. The others are kind of special purpose guns that were used in limited quantities. Now we get two of the more popular ones. The three inch, the, the bronze Napoleon is a gun you've seen all over. It doesn't look much different than some of the earlier uh, 18th century guns. The three inch ordnance rifle was made out of wrought iron. At that time they did not have decent steels, so the best they could do was wrought iron. The parrot rifle was a very unusual gun. It was made out of cast iron. And cast iron is very brittle and tends to have flaws in uh, casting. So to ensure at least they didn't get a failure at the breech, you'll notice a ring at the, in down near the uh, breech end of the gun. It's encased in a it shrink fit with a ring of wrought iron. That at least saved them from explosions in the breech. These guns did have a history of after being fired a number of times, uh, having the barrels fail and pieces go flying around didn't endear itself with artillerymen. But it was used quite a bit. Now, here's where we come into artillery. One gun sounds like a not big thing, but to pull it, you needed a six horse team and a limber, which you'll see in a minute what it is, but basically it went between whatever, it had the harnessing for the horses on it and how hook to tow the gun with. So they needed a six horse team to move it, another six horse team in Limber to move a case and they carried uh, about 600 pounds of ammunition they needed for the thing. They, and they needed, each one of those horses needed 24 pounds of feed every day. 12 pounds of forage and 12 pounds of grain. And they also required care, watering. In battle, they tended not to get it. A battery in the north was typically six guns, which means just pulling the guns themselves had 72 horses in a battery just for pulling the guns. And probably the entire complement of the battery was close to 100 horses just for six guns because of all the other things you had to bring along. In the South, uh, it was, they typically picked four because they were constantly in a problem. But the, to the South, artillery was extremely important because they tended to be in the defense and they could use it. They could make emplacements for these guns and use them for support for the troops. So to the South, a limited number of field guns was very important. To the North, it was less important unless they were being attacked like at Gettysburg. Now, the average life of a horse in artillery, which was the toughest service for a horse, was under eight months. There were times they were left in harness for three days if they were in a battle. They, just, and they were lucky to get water. They needed a constant resupply of horses. I had one, this, this was, both these armies were horse powered. I saw one quote where at Gettysburg, Lee had 72,000 horses. I know that he lost, that the total losses between North and South at Gettysburg was 3,000 horses. So it was, uh, they, they virtually denuded Virginia of horses, just supplying this. The South's problem was they didn't have enough of a supply, so as the war went on, it got tougher and tougher for them to move things. Now here's, uh, limber is the front piece. You had, on each side, you had three horses, one man rode one of the horses and controlled the other two on each side. So there were two riders and two horses that he controlled, giving you the six horses. And each gun required the limber up front, which had, depending on the size of gun you were carrying, you could maybe carry an extra ammunition box on it. Other, if, you were carrying, if you were pulling a heavy gun, you couldn't. That all varied. Now, we come to tactics. 
the, well, all these men basically were, the officers, were trained in the Mexican War and pre-Mexican War period, where the smooth war musket, smooth war musket was the main weapon. It had a 50 to 75 yard effective range. And it took uh, somewhere in the 25 second uh, time period to load. So basically, your opponent, if you were going for him, got one round to fire at you, and you were in amongst him if you decided to. Their typical tactics was they'd an attack, a couple of rows of soldiers, which is the most you could do, uh, would get within 50 yards of the defenders, fire a few volleys alternating between front and back row, and then charge with bayonets. In the earlier wars, about 30% of the casualties were caused by bayonets. The musket, as it was designed, was a combination spear and gun. And that's the way it was in the Revolution. Suddenly, rifling extended the effective range to over 200 yards. The effect of that was the attacker now had to take several volleys to get to the defenders. And practically, in all but one case I can come up with, a, a straightforward attack never made it to a bayonet charge. Not enough men survived. The defender typically, as the war went on, got, got into fortifications where his losses were relatively low. One of the more well-known uh, examples of that was Burnside's charge at the stone wall at Fredericksburg, where they sent regiment after regiment up against the stone wall with trenches behind it and just lot they just mowed the men down before, faster than as fast as they could bring them up the rifling gave a, the defense an immense advantage if you mounted a frontal attack on a fortified position it was virtually suicidal and the other big one was Pickett's charge at Gettysburg which was a similar thing Now we hit North versus South. The problem to restore the Union, the North had to win battles and they had to take Confederate territory. Winning a battle was a lot different than this condition for the South. They had to, the, the South only had to not lose. They didn't have to win, they had to just make sure that the Federals unions didn't win. They didn't lose their territory, and that because they were they were just defending the territory they had in the eleven states they had. And the it, fortifications, you know, in, within a couple of days, you could set up fortifications that were virtually impregnable. The problem the South had, as you'll notice, you could fortify a position and easily repel attacks if you had enough defenders, and that was the South's problem. Numbers of troops, which you'll see later on. Now both sides concentrated on the capitals and defense. The Union was much worried about political effects of even a temporary uh, seizure of Washington. The Confederacy literally, the major, a large percentage of their industrial capacity was in Richmond. If they lost Richmond, they were losing the ability to fight the war. So Richmond, in addition to being their political capital, was their industrial capital. So they made very sure that Richmond was well defended. They concentrated enough troops there, and the problem was they didn't have enough left over to cover the rest of the country. Now here we are. The, top, the only sets of these figures that are really accurate is the top set, the population. In the Confederate 11 states, there were free people, which is basically white people, 
5.6 million. It's more like, uh, there were about 140,000 freed uh, blacks there uh, to take out of that. But basically, 5.5 to 5.6 million total men. The North and District of Columbia had 18 million to make an army out of. The border states, the four border states, have about two and a half million, and they split pretty evenly between troops going north and troops going south. So if you go to it, there's nearly a three to one population advantage the north had over the south, it's just starting off. The army strength, and this pretty well went on, you can't get much in, the army in 1860 was about 15,000 men. That was pre-war. It was a regular army, mostly stationed in the West. 1861, you had 90-day militia and 180-day militia coming in and out of the army. No one's got any reliable figures. But by the January 1st of 1862, the Union had over half a million men under arms and the Confederacy had about as half as many. 1863 was about the same and losses incurred in 1863 by 1864 it was almost three to one in army size. And by 1865 the Confederacy was on its last legs. And whoops, one thing I didn't uh, go through that I should have. And on de industry in the middle. Just before the war, the North had 110,000 industrial establishment. The South had 18,000. The total industrial output of the South was equal to one quarter of the output of New York State. When you look at all these statistics, you see that the North had an immense superiority of the, over the Confederacy. But the Civil War went on for four years. How in the world did that happen? I mean, by, the math, by just the simple numbers, the South shouldn't have had a chance. It shouldn't have existed more than six months. But it did. And the answer really is the top commanders. Almost all the top commanders, both North and South, went to West Point. They got the same education. They all knew each other. They were in a small army. And it turned out that the average West Pointer had a lot, was a lot clearer about seeing the problems in his own troops than he was realizing what his opponents had. I heard a small, kind of a humorous story on Grant's army where it had been raining for weeks, the roads had turned into quagmires, everybody was just stuck, the army was stuck in the mud. And some colonel came up to him saying, if we got attacked, we couldn't move, we couldn't do anything about it. And Grant asked him, do you think it's raining over there where the enemy is? <laughs> <laughs> they were stuck in the mud too. <laughs> They were a lot more concerned, even when they were attacking, about what the enemy could do to him than what he could do to the enemy. There weren't very many aggressive people who came out of that school. And worse than that, most all of them tended to overestimate the size of the enemy forces. For the Confederacy, that was probably a good thing. For the Union it wasn't, because they always had the bigger army, but they somehow managed to magnify the Confederate army so they handled it like it was as big as they were, or bigger. The, there were only a few, and darn few, who withstood the pressures of upper command. Now Jefferson Davis, the President of the South, was a West Pointer. He found his generals very early in the war, and he got some really good ones. And until 1864, they just made mincemeat out of the Union armies. 
They took very big chances, but the conservative Union Army generals didn't take advantage of the holes that they left and got away with them. Now, we got the three, uh, the, Robert Lee, everybody's seen a picture of. Thomas Stonewall Jackson was really the moving force for special attacks. He could take half an army and set it up and move it in a flank attack, and he did it a number of times and caused virtual destruction of a federal army. Jeb Stewart was his cavalry, and by the way, those are his, his name was not Jeb, it, it, those are his initials. He was the cavalry commander, and the cavalry was your scouting force. He discovered where the enemy army was, and that was a tough thing to do when you're talking about typically in the east, 100,000 men spread out over three or four roads, uh, probably strung out 10 or 12 miles long in columns, you had to figure out where the army really was. And he could do it. And he kept uh, Lee pretty well informed. And Longstreet was his uh, steadying force in battle. Very good man as a number two. Didn't, he a couple of times got a chance at number one and didn't make it. Lincoln was a very unlucky president. At the end of 1861, he had three generals. Oh, look, abs they had resumes that looked gorgeous. <laughs> they were excellent administrators and did a wonderful job forming the army. And on paper, they looked great. He had George McClellan in the east, Henry Halleck, who was known as the Old Brains, who was commanding the west, and Don Carlos Buell in the middle. They, they put together their armies, but they found all kinds of reasons why they couldn't use them. They had to keep order where they were. They were there was excuse after excuse after excuse. Uh, you'll find Lincoln kept making uh, comments about Grant. He said he fights. And you'd wonder why, except that he had a whole slug of other generals who could find all kinds of reasons why they wouldn't fight. they try maneuvering, they'd try all kinds of things, but they wouldn't come to grips. Finally, in, at the end of 1861, a really obscure brigadier who'd resigned from the Army in 1854 over a drinking problem he had in California, and got to be a brigadier by virtually, he happened to know a politician who had the right to appoint a brigadier general. <laughs> it was literally that much of a chance. And through a number of other chances, he got to control, to, uh, control an army. And Halleck wrote a set of orders that he stretched a little bit, but gave him a chance to attack Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. Now the Confederacy had a defensive line in Kentucky that went from Columbus to Bowling Green across the state. And that was that line they had set up and they had to hold. This Fort Don Henry was sitting right in the middle of it. And 12 miles away, on the Cumberland River was Fort Donelson. It turned out that Fort Don Henry was badly sighted and it was half underwater, so it wasn't much. Grant quickly took Fort Henry. He then took his troops in what was really rainy weather, wet weather took them 12 miles across the river, invested Fort Donelson, and captured it. This cost the South 14,000 men and caused them to evacuate the defensive line in Kentucky. And the next defensive line was in northern Mississippi. So they lost the whole state of Kentucky, the western part of Tennessee, and a bit of the north of Mississippi just because of that one battle. 
So it's, it was a, ma a very, very important battle. Now in the next two years, Grant came along as a commander and he had a winning way. He won the Battle of Shiloh, which is a battle that the South absolutely had to win if it was going to ever restore its uh, position. It was a two-day battle and the first day went very badly and Grant very nearly lost the army. But he had uh, reinforcements nearby and instead of doing what most any other general would do after he'd been nearly lost his army and retreating, he took the reinforcements, put them in, and on the second day destroyed the southern army. The next big battle, and he fought several other in between, the next big battle was Vicksburg. And that's a campaign you have to read about, what went on there. Because in about a month he did something that was the equal of what Lee did in Virginia at times. And he captured 30,000 men at Vicksburg, plus another 6,000 when they heard Vicksburg had been captured, another 6,000 at Ports Hudson, which was, this is all on the Mississippi River, uh, was down on the Louisiana side. He lost 6,000 there, plus four or 5,000 more in the various battles that led up to Vicksburg. That one battle cost the South 40,000 men, which they did, couldn't afford. It was one of the reasons that the Army strength dropped so much in 1864. And on top of that, uh, opened up the Mississippi River. They basically, the Union controlled now most of five states in the Confederate, of the 11 states, uh, Arkansas and Texas were cut off and they controlled as much as they wanted to of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Louisiana. So the Confederacy was already getting smaller. The Vicksburg ha happened on July 4th, the day after the Battle of Gettysburg ended. So the South fought its two critical battles and ended virtually at the same time. And the South, the loss of Vicksburg, let's say Vicksburg for the next 80 years never celebrated the 4th of July. Give you an idea how, how badly they thought about it. Now Grant had on him several good generals and two of them, Sherman and Sheridan, got to be very good. In 1864, in March, he appoint, Lincoln appointed Grant as the lieutenant general, the top general in the army. He had control over the entire army and he basically ordered all his forces to mount an attack on the simple point that if you attack the Confederacy, they could defend one point, but some other point was going to break. Lots of things went wrong. They didn't go as planned, but they got straightened out in the end. That's basically a battle of attrition won. Uh, let's see, let's head ahead. Casualties. The rifling and the musket and basically <coughs> rifles, muskets, and field guns were later rifles gave the defense an advantage. They had it in the Civil War, they had it in World War I. It wouldn't, the offense wouldn't get the advantage until World War II. In the Civil War, the Union had to attack. It had no other choice because it had to win territory. And the result was high casualties. The quoted number in combat is 215,000. And the Confederacy, or excuse me, 140,000. The Confederacy, uh, with a smaller army, lost 74,000, which proportionately was about the same as far as percentages. The big other issue is other. Uh, we've spent the last 40 minutes talking about 
38% of the people who were lost in the Civil War. Other is where the other 62% were lost, simply to disease. Two -thir over two, two thirds, uh, no, excuse me, it was a little under two thirds of the deaths in the Civil War were just plain caused by disease. They gathered large numbers of men in small areas, and that's always been an invitation for disease and epidemics. It's happened every time. It, that's, that's been done before we had the uh, medicine we have now. By World War II, we could stop that kind of thing. In the case of the Civil War, they had expanded an army well beyond what anybody was used to, and they were just scrambling to try to do, somehow keep the army together, keep it somehow supplied, let alone do it right. The result was the men had inadequate shelter, the camps had poor sanitation. Personal hygiene was really bad. People didn't bathe very often then, and the soldiers didn't wash their clothes very often. They almost all had some kind of vermin with them. Their medical services were a lot less than they ought to have been, and the knowledge was bad, and the food they got fed was not great. They typically existed on coffee, hardtack, which was a hard bread, and bacon. Those were the three staples that they fed those men. Not a great diet for, <laughs> for people. The result was they had sickness all the time. There were lots of people who went into battle sick. Finally, in 1863, for the Union, Hooker did the one thing he did right when he was a top commander. He cleaned up their camps and minimized the disease through the end of the war. The Confederacy never had the chance to even handle something like that. So they had a large proportion of their deaths just plain due to people getting to, in large numbers and dying of disease. Disease was the biggest killer in the war. Now we hit the final accounting. The, the standard number quoted is 620,000 men out of a population of 31 million men died in that war. Now, I've seen numbers as high as 800,000, 750, it depends who you're talking to. They're not very exact, but certainly it was a large number. This was more deaths than all the other U.S. wars through the Korean War. So that's why, I, why it's called the bloodiest war. For the North, roughly one in nine men of military age died. But that included about 100, there were 180,000 uh, black soldiers in the Union Army, so some of them were uh, black soldiers. This was, to the North, turned out to be a big bump in the road because just after the Civil War, North expanded into the West and started in turning into an industrial state at the same time and very quickly probably by 1870 was the effects of the Civil War had pretty well worn off. The South was a much different story. Roughly one in four white males of military age died, and the only ones who fought were the white males. They used, uh, at times, slaves for non-combat duties, but the only people who fought were the whites, and a quarter of them were gone. These were the men who were husbands, and fiancés of young women. There were just a big shortage of men. There was an immense amount of destruction in the South due to the war. And it was basically a disaster for the South. To me, one of the biggest, somewhat unexpected things is that the South accepted the fact they'd been defeated. When you look at what they did, with President Lincoln's re-election in uh, 1864 in November, that was the end of their chance of ever having a separate state. There was no chance beyond that. The North was just going to grind them into the ground. 
and it was obvious to all. Yet they kept that war going for four and a half more months. They could have sued for peace and probably got a lot better conditions and had a lot less destruction than they got because what went on in those last few months of the war, Sherman virtually gutted all of the southern uh, states that he passed through. And what's amazing is the South who fought right to the bitter end and Lee had to be absolutely cornered before, he was before his army was captured and they surrendered. When it was over, they didn't continue fighting it as an insurrection, which happened in places like Ireland and would have been probably set this country back 50 years if it had ever happened. They accepted the fact they were treated. They grumble about it and some areas still grumbling about it, as people who've been in the South could tell you. But the fact is they accepted it. They went to work with all their energy and put it into recovery. And by about 1890s, they were pretty much recovered. They had, they had turned out all the problems, the residual problems of the Civil War got dumped on them, and they had to go sort them out. That kind of ends what I've got in the formal presentation. Uh, I'll be glad to open up the floor to any questions. Do I have any? Yes? Where and when did rifling of a gun barrel? Uh, rifling uh, had been around, gone around for a very long time. It goes back probably as late, early as the 1600s. The problem was that rifling before the mini ball, you had to drive, literally pound the ball into the, into the, into the gun so it would gauge the rifling. And it took forever to load the thing. So it had a very, it was accurate, but it had a very slow rate of fire. So it really wasn't very useful for combat. The rifling had been known that it worked and known, but what they didn't have was anything that would load in any reasonable period of time. Does that answer your question well enough? Yes. Uh, you're often here 65,000 at Gettysburg. <laughs> I, I read a little bit more about it and discovered I think it was 14,000. And the biggest casualty in most of the battles was missing in action. And uh, understandably so. Uh, well, the getting records, all of those battles had what they call stragglers. Basically, when battles hit, a significant proportion of those units would just disappear. They'd go to the rear, and getting a, a real casualty count, they could get the number present the next day, but men would drift into camp, and you know, it was the quoted figures I've seen that seem to be reasonable, reliable, is that each side lost around 22 or 23,000 men in that battle. Well, it's very hard to answer in any battle because of the, particularly on the Confederate side, but even on the Union side. How many men were actually lost and captured or were, is very, very hard to determine. I mean, another factor in the Civil War was roughly a third of the men who enlisted or were drafted <coughs> deserted. So it's very, very hard to get uh, an accurate count of numbers of forces and losses. You can get a rough idea of what happened on you know, a ratio of the two sides, but you can't get an exact number. Yes? Steely, the uh, prisoners of war, would you want to be a southern prisoner or a northern prisoner? Realistically, it probably didn't matter much. Number one, before about the point where the blacks were in the army in the north, uh, they generally didn't take prisoners. They put them on what they called parole. This was kind of a leftover of the gentlemen's wars of the Europeans. You were basically left to, uh, with your army, your army, your own army had to supply you, but you couldn't fight until you were exchanged for a man on the other side. So it was, there wasn't much prison. Once they did put in prison, the northern prisons weren't really much better. They were death, death traps. They were in Andersonville, but they weren't very good. There were some in New York that the death rates were horrible. 
Neither, neither side treated prisoners very well. The South couldn't and the North didn't. It's, it was not very good to be captured on either side. Yes? The prisons are horrible, I guess, aren't they? On both sides. Well, they, so they, they were just, ba they, they got inundated with large numbers of men. No one was prepared for it. <coughs> Half, in the South, they ended up in open fields with minimum shelter. And there was no place they could go to. If they escaped, they'd just get caught. It was, it was just poor in the South, particularly. They had trouble feeding their own people, let alone pr large numbers of prisoners. So it just, the South was bad, but the North didn't put a lot of attention into, you, know, you can see what happened in their own army camps where they were paying attention, let alone in a prison camp where they weren't paying attention. Yeah. I also noticed uh, by 1864, the uh, numbers of, of, of troops on the Southern side had, had Gone way down. Oh, yeah. Is this because of desertion and stuff, or well, the North you literally? Well, number one, the size of the Confederacy kept shrinking. You, you keep everyone thinks about the, the Civil War yeah. as what went on between Washington and Richmond. That turned out to be mainly a holding action. Neither side ever gained much between Washington and Richmond. It was static. Yeah. What happened was in the West. They first, the Union went down, took the Mississippi, then they moved inland. They got in, took the rest of Tennessee by eight, late 1863. They, had, they were into Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. And you know, just basically, they just kept cutting down the side, size of the Confederacy. So, so most- Essentially just using up the, yeah. used up the population. And the other thing later in the war was when Sherman started going through Georgia. I mean, the, the letters from home were yeah. just crying for somebody to come home. They, you know, when that, those armies went through, they picked everything clean. There was nothing left to support the people down there. They were just crying for the men to come home, and a lot of them deserted and went home. It was just... Sherman's march <coughs> to sea, was that effective? Uh, psychologically, it must have been on oh, itself, oh, yes. militarily, it was really Well, there wasn't necessary. anything military. The, by then, the South had virtually no army left in the West. Yeah. I mean, you could only do that if there wasn't any significant army in the West, and there wasn't any. After Atlanta, uh, what, what forces Hood had, had after Atlanta, he tried to go north with, got feated, defeated by Thomas. Uh, he, that was it. Once, once that force was defeated, there was no significant force. I mean, the war, if it hadn't ended in April, would have ended a month later because Sherman was already into North Carolina and within a month was going to come in behind Lee. So, I mean, it, clearly the war was done. And there was really no significant force that could uh, go up against them. They destroyed it. You, you look at what the numbers they had left for the West, there just wasn't any armies in the West. Yes. Was, <clears throat> was there any uh, real opportunity for the South to get uh, overseas help from England or from any other? Well, it's, let's say the Emancipation Proclamation really finished that off. There is no European state who would touch anything that was tied to slavery. It didn't do much here because it freed people who the army had no control over. But to the Europeans, it turned it into something tied to slavery, which they'd all outlawed. And they wouldn't touch it. With the emancip it was more a political statement to Europe than it was effective here. But you know, they, tr they tried things, basically they withheld. They stopped shipping cotton in the hopes that England, the England mill owners would get the government to recognize them. Uh, unfortunately, the blockade made that all ineffective. In reality, what it did was England starting up uh, cotton growing in places like Egypt. 
You've heard of Egyptian long cotton, various other sources. So the South basically, in not supplying cotton, had set up other sources. So when they come out of the war, they had competition. Mm -hmm. They weren't getting the prices they were getting before the war. Weren't there Confederate bonds that were basically uh, backed by uh, cotton exports? Um, I, I, so that one I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. There were very few. As soon as they lost New Orleans, that basically yeah. eliminated the South yeah. from exporting cotton. So, oh, yeah. the, uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, there were bonds, and the collateral behind them was uh, exporting cotton. That could well be. You know, <laughs> New Orleans was lost basically because of the Battle of Shiloh. The South had grabbed all of the men they could out of everywhere, including New Orleans. And when the Union uh, fleet came up there, there was nobody there to defend New Orleans. The, it was one of those, they never had enough men to defend the territory they had. So you can look at the East and say, boy, this is an awful stalemated war and the North looks terrible. But if you look at the West, they were just being mowed down. If you love statistics, one of the fun, one of the ones that I enjoyed the most was the reality that uh, the value of a black slave in today's dollar was about sixty thousand yeah. dollars. So the GNP of the South was equal to the North, but only because yeah. the three to four million blacks were valued at, at sixty thousand. And I, I realized this when right near Harbor's Ferry, there's a canal yeah. that was built from Washington toward Pittsburgh. And I asked a guide, I said, oh, I said, I'm sure that was built by the slaves. He said, oh, no, he said, uh, slaves are too, way too valuable. He said, we brought in all the Irish. <laughs> and, uh, you, could, you could hire an Irishman for 10 cents a day, and the black slaves yep. were far too valuable. So I thought that was uh, just a, a fascinating yep. juxtaposition. Yeah, in the north, the slavery was dying out. Really, if you look back, if it weren't for the cotton gin, slavery probably would have died out by 1810. It just wasn't economical. <coughs> about how smart the commanders were in the South. Why weren't they smart enough to give up earlier? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good question why they hung on. I mean, certainly in 1860, they had technically lost the war by the middle of 1863, with the loss of Gettysburg and Vicksburg, technically their chances of winning were between slim and none. But they hung on for another year. They were just, the people in charge were unwilling to give one inch. They even had a chance to negotiate in late 1864 with Lincoln, and he was willing to give to, get, to stop the war. And they weren't, they weren't even willing to talk about anything but two separate countries. Yes? Let me ask you, and, uh, you talked at the very beginning of your presentation about Gettysburg. You yeah. talked about uh, Pickett's Charge and, of course, yeah. all, the, all the associated battles. A lot of people say that, Rick, that uh, Robert E. Lee wasn't that far away from taking Gettysburg and marching on to not only Harrisburg, but to Philadelphia. And that could have changed the outcome of the war. Uh, he never came really close. I mean. The problem at Gettysburg was that the Union Army was at a, had set up a defensive position at a place called Pipe Creek. It was about 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. And Lee got his forces there. He was closer and got his forces there earlier. Mm -hmm. But the problem always the Confederacy faced is the Union had a bigger army. The longer the battle went on, the more Union forces got in. The road systems were such that you couldn't, you were limited in the number of men you could move. Mm -hmm. But if the battle went on for three days, the Union was going to end up with a bigger army. So the longer the battle went on, the worse it was for the Confederacy.